You know, what I like about this bit is that we're on the first railway ever built in the Edinburgh region. Are we really? Aye, 1831 it was built, but it was a railway line pulled by a horse. Was it? Aye. And the steam engine was used by rope to pull the engines back because they were bringing coal from over there at Dalkeith and taking it to the coal depot at Holyrood. I've heard it's called the Innocent Line. Do you know why it was got that name? I do. Well, that was when passengers started to use it. No tickets were issued, by the way. The fare was eight pounds all the way. Tickets weren't issued because the folk couldn't make up their mind where they wanted to go. They enjoyed the ride so much. You know, Tom, they nearly had an accident here in the railway line. Here's a block of Samson's ribs that fell down from right up in the top there. <laughs> yeah. You can see all the way it's come down. Uh, I wonder what came first though, the block or the railway? Well, I don't think we'll ever know that. <laughs> I've brought you here, Tom, to this, this rock which is called Hutton's Rock. Ah, what's special about it? Well, you see this red rock in here? Ah. This is a vein of hematite, Tom, and iron ore. You can see the red ore in there. Oh yes, and you could extract the iron from that. You could do, but there's an interesting little story behind this, that uh, it's called Hutton's Rock because Hutton came here when the quarrying was active and he saw that this interesting feature was about to be destroyed, so he asked the quarrymen to save this rock, and they did, so that future generations of geologists could see it. And these quarries, this was the quarrying for the paving stones of London, I believe. Yes, these stones would have been carried a long way. It's a very good hard rock, this. I believe. I believe the Earl of Haddington was responsible for reopening the quarry to the indignation of the people of Edinburgh. Well, you can appreciate why, and uh, nowadays they wouldn't get planning permission for quarrying here, would they? Ah, well, it had a very good result because it was bought for the state for £40,000. As little as that? Yes, and this road here is a very interesting road. Do you know why it's called the Radical Road? No, you tell me why. Walter Scott in 1820 had the idea of using unemployed Western Scotland weavers who were very much against the government. And he gave them a job to build what was then a rough path. That's this road that runs up and down here. Right over the crags and down the other side towards yeah. Holyrood. And the idea was, you see, the great mines of Edinburgh used to meet and walk along this road. David Hume, Walter Scott, Boswell, no doubt they talked about all the great matters of the day because that was the time when Edinburgh was at the peak of culture. It was a literary centre. It was. So the Radicals built the road and it became known ever afterwards as the Radical Road. And this is it we're walking on just now. And it's a beautiful walk. It's a lovely walk. I reckon it's probably one of the finest walks in Scotland. And uh, the Earl of Haddington did us a disservice because at the same time as this road was built, Scott had the idea of making an exotic garden around Samson's ribs. He was going to bring in exotic plants from abroad and make it a hanging rock garden. <laughs> It would maybe, have spoiled the place, wouldn't it? I was about to say, maybe he didn't know it would fall down in time. But anyway, the Earl of Harrington opened the quarries instead and was forever unpopular. So maybe his action resulted in the bang of the place where it was at a cheap price and bequeathing to the city probably one of the most unique little mountains that any city could ever own. Gee, you feel the cold when you come up the ridge? Yes, it's cold here in Winnie Hill. <laughs> Why, Winnie Hill is actually part of our first seat. That's the, the volcanic cone, yes. Aha, uh -huh. although it's a separate ridge. Yeah. And this takes us down to the it's old a, chapel. Yeah, to St Anthony's Chapel, an old 15th century chapel. So it's been standing here for over 500 years? It has. And you know, the rocks, the stones in it, tell us a bit about the, the way they, they built it at that time. You can see the blocks of basalt lava that uh, we saw down there, and there's some of the bits of tooth. Oh, that's the old uh, sediments. Yes, they just picked the stones up from round about. But you see, whenever they wanted a bit of dressed stone for the windows, Tom, ah. they, they went to the sandstone quarries in Edinburgh. Edinburgh was famous for its sandstone that's quarries. That's rather beautiful the way it's been chamfered out. Yes, they used sandstone as well there to, to get the, the dressed stone. I well, well, and it's actually standing on the lava. It's standing on the lava here, a good, and solid, firm foundation. And if it hadn't had that, it would have fallen down long ago. It would, yes. I was reading that St Anthony was a, a man who was born in Egypt way back 250 AD, and he sought the lonely places to commune with his soul, and he set up the very first monastery that we know of, in other words, the father of monasticism. But his connection here is really with James I. 
James I built a hospital over in Leith, and there was a great skin disease at that time known as erysipelas. There was a swelling of the face which spread over the head, ugly and very painful. An even earlier link with the past are these terraces of ancient cultivation high on the hill, cut out no doubt because the lower ground was too marshy for cultivation. People have been around here for a very long time. We know because Bronze Age implements have been dredged from shallow water. Maybe the folk carried the lime-rich clay from the bed of the loch to cultivate the terrace fields. Certainly the wild boar was hunted here and packs of wolves used to roam. What a place it must have been then, Edinburgh, the city and seven hills, but in fact, a mixture of lochs and swamp and very frosty this morning, I'll tell you. That's why I didn't stick to the path. It's really icy. And just below me is the village of Duddingston and a wee loch with its marshes that gives us something of a flashback to these distant times how many thousands of years ago, I don't know. The whole area of Arthur's Seat is, of course, the property of Holyrood Palace, and the five miles of the Queen's Drive was said to be the finest carriage drive in Europe, and probably still is. And everything within that drive used to be a sanctuary where a man could be safe from creditors for 24 hours. That was important at a time when you could be put in prison for debt. In 1645, it had another use. The sick who were in fever from the plague were taken there to die. Doctors were sent with them, but if they died, they were buried in the park. Thieves had hideouts in the park, so it wasn't a safe place to carry a lot of money about with you. As for Edinburgh itself, in the 18th century, it was crowded and filthy, with cows and pigs and horses and sheds and closes in the Royal Mile itself. Business life was conducted mainly in taverns. Whenever you wander around Arthur's seat of the Salisbury Crags, you see these white Land Rovers with the red stripes on the sides, and they seem to be able to go almost anywhere. I know that each one carries rescue equipment and first aid kits. I also know that rock climbing is forbidden, but people try it and get stuck. The men patrolling in the vans wear a uniform like the police, so I asked Sergeant Wilson whether these keepers regarded themselves as parkies to enforce the bylaws, or if they had real police powers. We used to be called the Royal Park Keepers. In 19, uh, 1974, we got the title of Royal Park Constabulary, and we're in the, the park as Royal Police of the park, and it's our duty to see that the park is maintained and no damage done to Crown property. And you live right on the spot? Yes, I stay in Medibank Lodge. Now, I happen to know, because people have told me, that you give talks and slideshows and you really love this park. Oh, well, I certainly do, yes. What's your own favourite bit? My own favourite bit, I'd say, is the Winnie Hill. It's a lovely part of the hill. You can be up in the top of the hill there, away from the noise of the city. In fact, you could be up in the middle of Russia and nobody knew you were there. Hear the birds sing? Hear the birds sing, the larks. It's lovely up there. But here at Duddingston's a particularly historic bit. Oh yes, particularly Duddingston village. It dates away back early years. In fact, they had 40 looms and they weaved a, a coarse linen here. The weavers were the 18th century, but the old kirk is away back 600 years before that. The old kirk is away, it dates back to the 12th century. And I believe the door is an old door, it's worth seeing. Well, it's a, a door. Norman door. Yes, but outside at the gates is a, a chain on a link and it's called the jugs. In the olden days, evildoers, they used to put the jug round their neck and so when the people come to the kirk on Sunday, they could see them. But the story I was told, and I think it's quite a good one, that used to be for any wives who didn't uh, do what their husbands told them, they used to put them on this and the people could see them on the Sunday. <laughs> and then, of course, just out in front of that is uh, the Laupin stones. And these stones are there for any old gentleman or any lady who wanted to mount their horse, they could step up the stones and then onto the saddle. And the sheep's heat in would be a busy place in these oh, days too. Oh, I expect too. it would be. It's still as busy as ever at the present time. The stewards, when they went hunting here, used to always go in and have a sheep's heat for their lunch. I wouldn't be surprised by that because Bonnie Prince Charlie's house is just round the corner from it. <laughs> 